Can we talk about asymptotic freedom, this very idea that you won the Nobel Prize for? Yeah. So it describes a very weird effect to me, <laughs> uh, the, the weird in the following way. So the, 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 you know, the way I think of most forces or interactions, the closer you are, the stronger the effect. The, the the stronger the force, yeah. right? With with quarks, uh, the closer they are, the the less so the strong interaction. Yeah. And in fact, they basically act like free particles when they're very sure. close. That's right. Yes. Well, but this requires a huge amount of energy. But like, can you describe me? Um, why? How does this even work? <laughs> well, how weird it is. A proper description must bring in uh, quantum mechanics and relativity. And it's, uh, so a, a proper description and, and equations. So a proper description really is, is probably uh, more, more, more than we have time for and, and uh, we require quite a bit of patience on your part. But- uh, well, How does relativity come into play? Wait, wait a minute. Oh, relativity is important because uh, when, when we talk about uh, trying to think about short distances, we have to think about uh, very large momenta and very large momenta are connected to very large energy in relativity. And so the connection between how things behave at short distances and how things behave at high energy uh, really uh, is connected through relativity in sort of a slightly backhanded way, quantum mechanics indicates that short to get to analyze short distances, uh, you need to bring in probes that uh, carry a lot of momentum. This again is related to uncertainty because uh, it's the fact that you have to bring in a lot of momentum that interferes with the possibility of determining. Uh, position and momentum at the same time. If you want to determine position, you have to use instruments that bring in a lot of momentum. And because of that, those same instruments can't also measure momentum because they're disturbing the momentum. <laughs> that, that, uh, and then the momentum brings in energy and yeah. So, so that there's also the effect that asymptotic freedom comes from uh, the possibility of spontaneously making uh, quarks and gluons for short amounts of time that that fluctuate into existence and out of existence uh and uh the fact that that can be done with a very little amount of energy and and uncertainty and energy translates into uncertainty in time so if you do that for a short time you can do that uh well it's it's all it comes in a package, and you can you can. So uh, I told you it would take a while to really un, to really explain, but the uh, but but the results can be understood. I mean, we can state the results uh, pretty simply. I think so. Uh, in everyday life, we do encounter some forces that increase with distance and kind of turn off at short distances. That's the way rubber bands work, if you think about it. <laughs> or, uh, you, if you pull them hard, they, they, they resist, and, but, but they get flabby if, <laughs> if, if, if the rubber band is not, not pulled. Uh, and so there are, that can happen uh, in the physical world, but what's, what's really difficult is to see how that could be a fundamental force that's yeah. consistent with everything else we know. And that, that's what asymptotic freedom is. It says that uh, there are there's a very particular kind of fundamental force that involves special particles called gluons with very special properties that uh, enables that kind of behavior. So ex there were experiment at the time we did our work. There were experimental indications that quarks and gluons did have this kind of property, but uh, there were no equations that were capable of capturing it, and we found the equations and showed the, how they work and showed how they that they were basically unique, and this led to a complete theory of how the strong interaction works, which is the quantum chromodynamics uh, we mentioned earlier. And so, uh, 
so that's the phenomenon that that quarks and gluons interact very very weakly when they're close together that's connected through relativity with the fact that they also interact very very weakly at high energies so if you have so at high energies uh the simplicity of the fundamental interaction gets revealed you know, at the time we did our work the the clues were very subtle but nowadays at high, at what are now high energy accelerators it's all obvious so we would have had a much well somebody would have had a much easier time <laughs> 20 years later looking at the data you can sort of see the quarks and gluons as i mentioned they leave these short tracks that you, uh it would have been much much easier but but we from fundamental from indirect clues we were able to piece together enough to make that behavior a prediction rather than a, a post diction right so it becomes obvious at high energies it becomes very obvious when when we first did this work it was uh frontiers of high energy physics and at big international conferences there would always be sessions on testing qcd and whether these whether this proposed description of the strong interaction was in fact correct and so forth and it was very exciting there were big in, but uh, nowadays the same kind of work but much more precise with calculations to more accuracy and experiments that are much more uh, precise and comparisons that are very precise uh now it's called calculating backgrounds because <laughs> it's uh, because yeah. people take this for granted and and want to and want to see deviations from the theory which would be which would be the, the new discoveries yeah the cutting edge becomes the foundation the foundation becomes boring yes yeah. <laughs> uh uh is is there some for basic explanation purposes is there something to be said about uh strong interactions in the context of the the strong nuclear force for the for the attraction between protons yeah well and neutrons versus the the interaction between quarks within protons yeah. so well quarks and gluons have the same relation basically to nuclear physics as electrons and photons have to atomic and molecular physics so atoms and photons are the dynamic entities that really come into play in chemistry and and, and atomic physics of course you have to have the atomic nuclei but those are small and relatively inert really the dynamical part <laughs> and you know for, for most purposes of chemistry you just say you have this tiny little nucleus which this which qcd gives you <laughs> don't worry about it <laughs> just it's there the real the real action is the electrons moving around and exchanging and things like that. uh the uh but okay but we wanted to understand the nucleus too and uh so atoms base are sort of quantum mechanical clouds of electrons held together by electrical forces which is photons and then this radiation which is also another aspect of photons so that's where all the fun happens is the electrons and the photons and yeah, all that kind of that's stuff. right and the nucle the nucleus are kind of the the, uh, the well they they're necessary they give the positive charge and most of the mass of matter uh but they don't since since they're so heavy they don't move very much in chemistry and uh uh I'm oversimplifying drastically but they're but, not contributing much to the interaction in chemistry they, 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 for most purposes in chemistry you can just idealize them as concentrations of positive mass and charge that are that are uh uh, uh you don't have to look inside but people are curious what's what's inside what really <laughs> and and uh that and that was a big thing on the agenda of 20th century physics starting in the 19 well starting with the 20th century and uh, unfolding throughout of trying to understand what forces held the atomic nucleus together what it was and so uh anyway the the emerge the story that emerges from QCD is that very similar to the way that well broadly similar to the way that uh, uh, clouds of electrons held together by electrical forces uh, give you atoms and ultimately uh, mo molecules uh, protons and neutrons are like atoms made now out of quarks 
quark clouds held together by gluons, which are like like the, like the photons that that hold, uh, give the electric forces, but this is giving a different force, the strong force, and uh, and the residual forces between protons and neutrons that uh, uh, are left over from the the basic binding are like the residual forces between atoms that give molecules, but in the case of protons and neutrons, it gives you atomic nuclei. So again, for definitional purposes, uh, QCD, quantum chromodynamics, is basically the physics of strong interaction. Yeah, we understand. We now would understand. Would I think most physicists would ju would say it's the theory of quarks and gluons and how they interact. <laughs> <laughs> but okay. it's it's a very precise, and I think it's fair to say, very beautiful theory based on mathematical symmetry of a high order. Uh, and another thing that's beautiful about it is that it's kind of in the same family as electrodynamics. The conceptual structure of, this, of the equations are very similar. They're based on having particles that respond to charge in a, a very symmetric way. In the case of electrodynamics, it's photons that respond to electric charge. In the case of quantum chromodynamics, there are three kinds of charge that we call colors, but they're nothing like colors. They really are like different kinds of charge. Mm -hmm. uh, they rhyme with the same kind of, uh, like it's similar kind of dynamics. Similar kind of dynamics. I call, I say, I like, I like to say that QCD is like QED on steroids. <laughs> and instead of one photon, you have eight gluons. Instead of one charge, you nice. have three color charges. But there's a strong family resemblance between <laughs> <laughs> But the context in which uh, QCD does its thing is at, at much higher energies. Like that's where it comes to Well, life. it's that's a stronger it's force. So that to, to access how it works and kind of pry things apart, you have to inject more energy. And so that, that, that gives us, um, in some sense, a hint of uh, how things were in the earlier universe. Yeah, well, in that regard, asymptotic freedom is a tremendous blessing because it means things get simpler at high energy. And the universe was born free. Born free, that's very good, <laughs> yes. The universe okay. was born. So, so in atomic physics, I mean, I mean, a similar thing happens in the theory of stars. The stars are hot enough that uh, the interactions between electrons and photons are, they're, they're liberated. They don't form atoms anymore. They make a plasma, which in some ways is simpler to understand. You don't have complicated chemistry. And in the early universe, according to QCD, similarly, atomic nuclei dissolved into the constituent quarks and gluons, which are moving around very fast and interacting in relatively simple ways. And so this, uh, this opened up the early universe to scientific calculation.